from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm delighted to introduce our next reader, author, Kate DiCamillo. <laughs> She, she is a storyteller of the first order. She's written about a sad organ grinder. She's written about the adventures of a fearless, not-so-chicken chicken, a fat little porky named Mercy Watson, a toy rabbit who loses his way and finds himself on a miraculous journey, a mouse named Despero who loves music and stories, and of course, the beloved fun and funny dog, Win Dixie. She's often asked where she gets her ideas, and her answer is a ready one. And I'm quoting from listening, from looking, from eavesdropping and imagining. Stories are everywhere, and all you have to do is pay attention. Now, a lot of us are going to be paying attention to her new book, The Magician's Elephant. It's a fabulous fable, if that's not redundant. And one of the lines that caught me as a fortune teller is when a fortune teller tells the boy Peter, the truth is forever changing. If any of you has visited her website, you know a little bit about her. She describes herself as loud and as someone who hates to cook but loves to eat. She considers herself lucky because she gets to tell stories for a living. But I think we're all lucky because we get to listen and read. So let's get to the heart of the story. Please welcome Kate DiCamillo. I thought maybe y'all would go home because it was raining. Um, but I sure am glad that you're here. Uh, uh, what I like to do is do um, question and answer where you guys would ask the questions and I would come up with something that resembles an answer. Um, but I'd also like to read to you from the new book. So um, does anybody have a new book that I could borrow? Um, <laughs> you do? You got the elephant book? That's great. Also, my Aunt Anne is here somewhere. Oh, she's in the front row. What a good Aunt Anne. Can you stand up, Aunt Anne? That's my Aunt Anne. I, uh, I love her a lot. She didn't come here just to hear me. I mean, she lives here, so it's not like it was a big struggle for her to get here. <laughs> she doesn't travel around the country with me. Um, so, <laughs> do you, Anne? No. This is uh, The Magician's Elephant. I'll just read you all a little bit, and then you can ask me questions, because I think I'm only up here for um, 30 minutes. Anybody feel like they have a question already before I've even read? OK, that's one or two people. That should keep us busy. All right. <laughs> Chapter 1. At the end of the century before last, in the market square of the city of Baltice, there stood a boy with a hat on his head and a coin in his hand. The boy's name was Peter Augustus Duchin, and the coin that he held did not belong to him, but was instead the property of his guardian, an old soldier named Vilna Lutz, who had sent the boy to the market for fish and bread. Peter read the small sign once and then again. The audacity of the words, their dizzying promise, made it difficult suddenly for him to breathe. He looked down at the coin, the single floret in his hand. But I cannot do it, he said to himself. Truly I cannot, for if I do, Vilna Lutz will ask where the money has gone and I will have to lie. And it is a very dishonorable thing to lie. He put the coin in his pocket. He took the soldier's hat off his head and then put it back on. He stepped away from the sign and came back to it and stood considering again the outrageous and wonderful words. But I must know, he said at last. He took the floret from his pocket. I want to know the truth and so I will do it. 
but I will not lie about it, and in that way I will remain at least partly honorable. With these words, Peter stepped into the tent and handed the fortune teller the coin. And she, without even looking at him, said, One floor it will buy you one answer and only one. Do you understand? Yes, said Peter. He stood in the small patch of light, making its sullen way through the open flap of the tent. He let the fortune teller take his hand. She examined it closely, moving her eyes back and forth, back and forth, as if there were a whole host of very small words inscribed there, an entire book about Peter Augustus Duchene composed atop his palm. Huh, she said at last. She dropped his hand and squinted up at his face. But of course, you are just a boy. I am 10 years old, said Peter. He took the hat from his head and stood as straight and tall as he was able. And I'm training to become a soldier, brave and true. But it does not matter how old I am. You took the floret, so now you must give me my answer. A soldier, brave and true, said the fortune teller. She laughed and spat on the ground. Very well, soldier, brave and true. If you say it is so, then it is so. Ask me your question. Peter felt a small stab of fear. What if after all this time he could not bear the truth? What if he did not really want to know? Speak, said the fortune teller. Ask. My parents, said Peter. That is your question, said the fortune teller. They are dead. Peter's hands trembled. That is not my question, he said. I know that already. You must tell me something that I do not know. You must tell me of another. You must tell me, the fortune teller narrowed her eyes. Ah, she said, her, your sister. That is your question? Very well. She lives. Peter's heart seized upon the words. She lives, she lives. No, please, said Peter. He closed his eyes. He concentrated. If she lives, then I must find her. So my question is, how do I make my way there to where she is? He kept his eyes closed. He waited. The elephant, said the fortune teller. What, Peter said. He opened his eyes, certain that he had misunderstood. You must follow the elephant, said the fortune teller. She will lead you there. Peter's heart, which had risen up high inside of him, now sank slowly back to its normal resting place. He put his hat on his head. You are having fun with me, he said. There are no elephants here. Just as you say, said the fortune teller. That is surely the truth, at least for now. But perhaps you have not noticed. The truth is forever changing. She winked at him. Wait a while, she said. You will see. Okay, who's got questions? Yes. What inspired me to write Win Dixie? Um, I uh, grew up in Florida. And I live in Minneapolis, and um, I wrote, because of Winn-Dixie, um, the second winter that I was in Minneapolis, which was the worst winter on record. Do you know anything at all about Minnesota and what the climate is like? It's roughly the equivalent of Siberia. So to say that it was like the worst winter on record is a considerable statement. It was like 25, 30 degrees below zero for like five days in a row. That was the high. And so you go and you like open your car door and pieces of it just fall off. <laughs> and um, so I was kind of homesick for Florida. Um, and I couldn't afford to go back home, um, but I could write a book that took me there. And also it was the first time in my life that I'd been uh, without a dog. I was experiencing dog withdrawal. Um, so it, like if I was in a car and there was a dog in the car next to me and we were at a stoplight, I would beep the horn and wave at the dog. <laughs> uh, that's how bad it was. And so I made up a dog since I couldn't have one. I made up the best dog that I could imagine. And I was aware of doing none of that as I was doing it. All I knew was that I felt this need to tell the story, but looking back, I can see it came from those two things, from wanting a dog and from uh, 
wanting it not to be 30 degrees below zero. So, um, yes. Where did I get the idea for the elephant? Um, I was in um, a hotel in New York City. I was waiting to meet somebody, and I just had this sudden, really powerful uh, image of uh, this kind of washed-up, desperate magician. You know, I could, like, smell him almost. You know, like kind of like he smelled like hair lotion and dust. And... Um, <laughs> And so I, I always have a notebook with me. I thought, oh, that's kind of a compelling image. I took, it, I took out the notebook to write down this magician that had popped into my head. And when I reached into my notebook, I had a gift for um, a friend that I was going to meet later in the day. And that gift was a notebook with an elephant on the cover of it. So when I started to write about the magician wanting to do real magic, it wasn't then I think my mind went to that elephant. And I thought, man, what kind of magician could conjure an elephant, which is what the magician does in this book. Um, I don't want to lose you guys in the back. How about in the pink right there? Um, the Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. Um, I received a uh, rabbit doll as a Christmas gift. And I was like, wow, thanks. Um, it was like... <laughs> kind of creepy looking, you know, like this tall and a rabbit. He wasn't China, but he was like, he's melamine, so a lower order of, you know, <laughs> doll. And, um, but dressed very elegantly. And um, so I, I brought him home and I put him on the couch in my living room and every time I walked by him, he kind of scared me. And um, then uh, like, like the third night I had him, I had this dream of him um, uh, underwater face down with none of his clothing on. Um, and so that's where I started, was thinking, well, how did he get there? It seemed like a really compelling image. And so he's, that rabbit is in my office now, and I, he doesn't frighten me anymore. I go, y you have been a very productive rabbit. That's what I, it's like. Um, you are a grown-up all the way in the back, and I want you to shout. Yeah, that you had your, yeah. Which book is my personal favorite? I can't do it. I, you know, they're like my kids. I see them as deeply flawed and lovable anyway and uh, <laughs> equally lovable, you know? Um, so I can't pick a favorite among them. Microphones. Somebody saying there are microphones somewhere. Oh, hey, look, you're at a microphone. Great. Okay, let's talk. What inspired you to write The Tale of Despero? Uh, Tale of Despero was um, my best friend's son, uh, Luke Bailey, um, told me that he had a great idea for a story. And I said, what was it? He said, well, it's an unlikely hero with exceptionally large ears. <laughs> and I said, what happens to him, this unlikely hero? And he said, I don't know. That's why I want you to write the story. <laughs> and. I had no intention, I don't, you know, it's not typically how I would work. And I said that to him, it's like, I can't do anything with that, that's not my kind of story and I don't know what to do with it. But I loved the phrase, unlikely hero, and it stuck with me and so ultimately I ended up uh, writing the book. And by the time the, he was eight years old when he asked for it, and by the time it was published and then when we got the Newberry for it, he was, um, I think he was 13 or 14, and he was. I made him come to the the Newberry banquet, and he was. He's never. He was just like, you know. <laughs> I made him stand up and everything. He was like, oh. So it wasn't exciting for him. By the the writing is a slow process, you know. Yes. Where did I come up with Miggery Sal? I don't know where Miggery Sal came up with, uh, uh, where how I came up with that idea um, or that person. And I never feel like I come up with them anyway. It's more like the characters come and find me. And so it's always hard to figure out exactly um, how and when they'll show up, which makes it a really hard job because you, you keep on hoping that they'll show up, but you can't make them show up. And I don't know where she came from. Um, but she, in the book, she broke my heart and made me laugh at the same time, and I, I had a great deal of love for her. Is there another microphone? Is, is this the only microphone? Right here. Oh, hey! Hey, Hi. okay. What was your reaction when you, um, when you got the, 
when you found out that they wanted to make the tale of Despero into a movie? What was my reaction? Well, I've been having like um, a reaction that's been going on for 10 years ever since um, uh, Candlewick called up and said that they wanted to publish Win Dixie. It's like, gee whiz, you're kidding me. I mean, it's all seemed unbelievable to me. So then by the time Hollywood calls and says that they want to make a movie, it just seems, I mean, sometimes I, I wake up and I just start laughing. You know, it's like, you know, my, my great dream was um, to, like, make enough money from writing that I could uh, go down to working 30 hours a week. So I never thought about movies or anything like that. So it's all just been kind of an unbelievable, wonderful gift. And I exist in a constant state of surprise. Um, well, see, that's good. I like that. I'm just like I'm playing to all those beautiful words coming out over here. I love that. Okay, um, all the way in the back, you've got a mustache. That should make you um, stand out. Yeah. What made me want to become a writer? I had failed at everything else um, <laughs> I had. I was I'm what you call a late bloomer. But um, truly, uh, I'm a reader. And I think that if you're a passionate reader, you get to the point after a while where you want to tell a story back because um, stories saved me. And so um, it's, uh, you feel compelled to answer those stories that have been told to you. So, and I had failed at everything else. I mean, I used to, um, I used to work at Disney. Um, I wore, I want you to listen to this carefully, a polyester baby powder blue space suit. <laughs> and my job was to tell people to watch their step. So. <laughs> Um, you can see why I'm surprised every day. Um, we'll go back to a microphone. Yeah. How come you decided, how come you decided to make Despero a mouse? How did I decide to make Despero a mouse? Well, I had that, the, the, you know, the unlikely hero part, and I had the big-eared part. And um, I couldn't think of anything more unlikely for a hero than a mouse. And also, then it just made me laugh to think about a mouse with big ears. So it was not like I uh, sat there and thought about it, but I started just with that phrase, unlikely hero, and with the, the idea of the big ears in the back of my head. And those two things came together that way. And he is a very unlikely hero. Um, he, I mean, he goes down into a dungeon to rescue a human princess with a sewing needle. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, <laughs> What are his chances? Uh, okay, um, you're back there. You're, uh, it's blue. You look friendly. I don't know. <laughs> Pardon? What do you mean stories What do I mean stories saved me? I mean that um, I was the kind of kid who felt like I got seen because librarians saw me. And... Um, I, there was a four-book uh, rule uh, for Cooper Memorial Public Library in Claremont, Florida. You could only check out four books at a time. And um, I, was, I was pronounced a true reader by uh, Miss Alice, who was the librarian there at the time. And I could, had carte blanche. I could check out as many, store, and as many books as I wanted at a time. It saved me. It made me understand who I was. Um, and every book that I read helps me see the world more clearly and helps me understand uh, myself better. So that's what I mean by getting saved. And thank you to all the librarians out there, you know. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.